What do you think fasting accomplishes? From the perspective of spiritual empowerment and visitations. Fasting is an ancient tradition. It didn't begin with our generation. Fasting is not unique only to Christianity. Fasting is an ancient way of spirituality. So what does fasting do for us? You see, there is a harmony that the body must achieve with the very desires of the heart, the very state of the heart, the very state of the mind for both spirit, soul, and body to become one. You see, fasting is beyond an exercise. To wield the powers of fasting so that fasting can become effective, you must understand that the bodily exercise of fasting may not profit so much. Because if exercise is done bodily, it doesn't profit much. So fasting is actually a means by which you sustain a posture. That's what fasting does for you. It takes your mind, your spirit, and your soul to a posture. So when you begin your journey of fasting, you must conquer the gate of your appetite. You can gauge the level of the desires that have found root in a man's life when you begin that journey of fasting. It will first reveal to you the level of energies that the things that distracts you from spiritual equilibrium, it, it will show you the power those things hold on your mind. So your appetite for food will cry out. Your appetite for activity will cry out. Or your appetite in anger, everything will begin to cry out. To show you the measure of control, that, that's when someone will offend you and then you will now know that there was, there was a whole vault of anger inside your spirit that was not exposed until this fasting. You will know whether you've harnessed discipline, whether you've harnessed self-control. There's a way as you begin your journey in fasting, it shows you where you are placed and takes you on a journey to where you should be placed. It's a spiritual lecture. So when we begin the exercise of starving the primary survival need of our human body, there are certain things that are exposed to us. You learn discipline under stress, not under comfort. You learn control under pressure, not under leisure. So you have to go to that first gate of washing your clothes for three days, cleansing yourself. So guess what? You starve yourself of feeding, first of all. And as you starve the body of feeding, you now starve the mind of also feeding. How do you starve the mind of feeding? You starve the mind of feeding by starving it of interactions. There are certain interactions that you will no longer engage in because you've separated yourself into the place of fasting so that you can be positioned encounters. That is why most of the times very powerful fasting will separate you from people, separate you from activities. You starve yourself off the feeding of your mind with the things of this world. You starve yourself of motion. Your activities are cut down. You are separated unto the Lord and then guess what? You begin to discipline yourself to call upon the name of the Lord even in the midst of the distractions of your hunger. The distractions of your appetite you, even though they are present in that place, you now begin to discipline yourself to call upon the name of the Lord. What that whole thing is trying to do for you is to put you in a place, in a state. The power of fasting is beyond your stomach being starved of food. That's bodily exercise. Because if you are not careful, you will think the power of this fasting is, is you starving yourself. That's your first lesson. To tell you that to seek spiritual things, you have to leave the place of pleasure, like I always teach you. Nothing really spiritual is given on the table of pleasure. There's nothing tangible that can be given to a man on the table of pleasure. Even discipline is imparted by pain. Self-control is, is imparted by pressure. Because if you are a master of your mind in pain, you'll be, a, you'll be an overcomer and a ruler of your mind in peace. The next lesson fasting takes you into after you pass through the gates of the distractions that are in your body, after they're exposed and the appetites that had hold over you are brought into the light and they begin to cry out loud. You know, when you are fasting, that's when sometimes your sexual appetite will spike. Everything will be spiking in your body. And then you don't allow any of those things to distract you. You now get to the second gate of fasting, which takes you to the place of agape because anything done in God must be done in agape. So in fasting, you will now begin to learn to live beyond yourself. So you lose the bonds of wickedness. You help the needy. You take care of the widow. Guess what? It is not the action yet. It is the place that this thing is taking you to. 
because you can do all these things and where you want to be placed is where men can look at you and accord to you the respect of that activity. And Yeshua said, you've received your reward. So you now begin to live beyond yourself. You'll be given opportunities to live beyond yourself, to sacrifice. He told them, he said, before I come to meet you, tell those that even have wives not to meet their wives. You, you will go beyond fulfilling your desire. Now you are not living for yourself. And after you pass through these gates, you'll now get to the place of equilibrium, oneness, where you wait. Instructions are given to you to wait. Many will hear this, but only few will hear it. So it's actually a whole journey. And your waiting area becomes your place of encounter. So fasting is beyond starving the, the belly. Because if it is the starvation of the belly that brings power, people that are literally going through starvation because of poverty, they would have been the most powerful people on earth. It's the place fasting takes a spiritual man to. God calls that posture humility. When a person is now humble, you are no longer, you see, the, the leaven around us is taken away. There's no more excesses around our spirit. See, when we think of humility, don't just think of people bending down. Also think of people being debased. Excesses are, are now be, have now been removed. Your measuring is now reduced to, to the barest minimum. That oneness is now achieved. It's a, it's, it's a positioning. It's a positioning. So when you began fasting, you were here. And then, at the end of the fasting, you've moved and you are placed somewhere. What people call spiritual. You become spiritual. Does it mean your body disappears? What does it mean to be spiritual? Your consciousness has shifted from the natural to the supernatural. Your sensitivity has shifted from the natural to the supernatural. And your preferences have shifted from the natural to the supernatural. So I say be spiritually minded. And that is life eternal. Now, this lecture I'm, I'm sharing with you now, as we're worshiping God, he was just talking to me. Fasting is actually a journey. Don't make fasting to become bodily exercise because it doesn't profit much. Bodily exercise on losing weight. And the true aim of the fasting is to lose weight. Bodily exercise. When your needs are not necessarily met, that is how you know yourself. You know yourself. Oh, yeah. Look at Yeshua. After 40 days, he was hungry. The tempter came tempted him with what he needed but after 40 days he had also had the rule over his appetite so he can still choose he could still choose not to turn stone to bread so fasting takes us to a place and that's the place that gives us power so there are many who are in fasting and nothing seems to happen around them they are in fasting and all they see are the visions of their distractions they are in fasting and it's as though the fasting triggered the distractions that had settled in their spirit. And after fasting, that period, they fight more battles of the flesh than they've ever confronted. They had not gone past the first gate. Fasting exposes your former masters. Craving. You see, to know the flesh, you must know the lust of the flesh. The flesh on its own is not powerful without the lust that's in the flesh. And the lust of the flesh is actually the lust that's in this world. That lust is a very strong pull. It thrives on the strong desires and the cravings that that human being has built and made a part of his being. Everyone is enslaved by the chains of the lust that he allowed to attach itself to his soul, his desire. And there are principal entities, or let me put it this way, there are principal variables that if overcome, it will be much more easier to defeat the rest. So if you want to win a people, go for their king. Principal entities or variables around the life of a person. When you go into a place of debasing or fasting or separation, what happens is that the principal entities that have the rule over you, both flesh and spirit, begin to come alive. Because there is something a human being denying himself does to the human being. You want to see power, enter denial. You want to build a beautiful body, enter denial. You want to build financial discipline, enter denial. Anytime you want to build anything valuable, you must pass through the road of denial. Deny yourself sleep. Deny yourself certain pleasures. Deny yourself certain amenities. It's the road of denial that produces the life that you need. The Bible says, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground that die, it abideth alone. Spiritual things are not given on the table of pleasure. This world is not even ready for heavenly things. The things we thought we knew, they are more advanced than we thought, than we, the things we thought we knew, 
they are more advanced than we think. Don't ever take any spiritual thing at face value. In fact, most of the time, the things you see at face value is but an invitation to the reality of that thing. So when you fast, Sabiola, be attentive to the place fasting takes you to rather, to, rather than to the activity of the fast itself. Be attentive to what? To the place where fasting takes you to rather than to the activity of fasting itself. There's no power in the activity of fasting, but there is power in the journey of fasting. Takes you to a place. Takes you to a place. Because to make you, it must first waste you. For you to spring forth, you must first die in the ground.